this computer. All right, just got to record and then share. Perfect. All right, hopefully you can see my screen there. Looks good. All right, so I'll just, uh, I think a lot of you guys may be familiar with uh, the Willistown Conservation Trust, but I'll just uh, give you a brief overview. Um, we have been around since 1996. We're a nonprofit land trust dedicated to saving, studying, and sharing land, habitat, and water resources in the Upper Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creek watersheds. So our program area encompasses 20,000 acres. We're based out of Newtown Square. Um, we've protected 7,500 acres, um, which are permanently protected protected mostly through conservation easements. That's our primary tool for land conservation. And the reason why you can drive through Willistown, um, you know, just minutes away from all of the development in Newtown Square or Malvern or Fraser, uh, and see all this open space still. So over the years, we have um, expanded our mission from simply conserving land to bringing people into the land to connect. Um, you make that those deep connections that we're all hardwired for. We have a variety of core activities uh, in addition to our land preservation, including habitat stewardship. So we have uh, four nature preserves, now actually five nature preserves with the acquiring of a new one right across uh, Providence Road. Some of you may have heard that in the news, uh, the land that we acquired from M. Night Shyamalan from our new um, Kestrel Hill Preserve, so that's exciting. Uh, and so on all of our preserves, we model sound land management um, uh, techniques. Uh, we try and demonstrate to local landowners uh, things that they can do uh, in their little patches of habitat, however big or small, uh, whether that's planting trees along a riparian zone to uh, increase stream health or creating a native wildflower meadow where there was once, once lawn, uh, we also have our watershed protection program, uh, which in partnership with Academy of Natural Sciences, we study our stream health of uh, the streams that go through our watersheds. Uh, we do things like study uh, microplastic pollution, um, uh, sediment runoff from roads, uh, and even the uh, macroinvertebrates, the aquatic insects that live in the streams, which can indicate our uh, water quality. We have also our regenerative agriculture program, which is located at our Rushton Woods Preserve. Um, I'm sure many of you as birders may have been there before. So this is our six acre farm, which is situated within a wildlife preserve, an 86 acre, acre wildlife preserve, which is pretty unique. Um, generally, most farms happen at the expense of wildlife, but here we're trying to prove that both can coexist. So we have, for example, uh, rows of native wildflowers right next to the farm fields to promote a beneficial balance of predator and prey insects so that we don't have to use chemicals, for example. Um, and they're always, our farm staff's always focused on um, the health of the surrounding ecosystem, keeping the soils healthy, rotating the crops. Everything is done with respect to the environment. And uh, showing you these pictures gives you a little more better feel for Rushton Woods Preserve. It, it's not just a farm. There's many different varieties of habitats. So we, there's about 30 acres beyond the farm in what we call early successional shrub habitat or shrubland habitat, open meadows. And then that transitions into mature woodlands. So with all this variety of habitat, we have a variety of species, variety of bird species. Um, it's a very biodiverse um, environment. And for that reason, we are an Audubon designated important bird area. Uh, there are have been over a hundred species documented using the preserve, including 38 species that breed in our mature woodlands. Uh, 
These three are some Pennsylvania state responsibility species like the wood thrush, uh, the scarlet tanager in the lower left, and the worm-eating warbler on the right. So these are all species for which Pennsylvania plays a critical role for securing the global security of uh, the species by hosting 10% of its North American population. So that goes for all of these. So this is the perfect setting for our bird conservation program. Uh, and our bird conservation program really starts with our uh, Rushton Woods Banding Station is sort of the uh, focal point. And around that, we have uh, research and monitoring. Uh, the bird banding is the scientific research that we do, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later in this talk uh, for those who aren't familiar with the practice of bird banding. We have education and outreach, um, much of which happens at the bird banding station and then our um, habitat stewardship. So we do a lot on our preserve to not only to promote habitat for biodiverse, for uh, species of wildlife and birds, but also um, to educate people on um, sound habitat management. So we'll start with the ugly and then move into prettier things. <laughs> so get this out of the way. I'm sure most of you uh, know or have seen the headlines um, in the uh, leading scientific journal so called Science. Um, several years ago, uh, the numbers came out. The science says we have lost a third of our birds, 29% uh, or almost 3 billion birds gone in less than one human lifetime, so 50 years. And this includes birds in really all habitats, um, not just one or two, it's across the whole spectrum. So one third of all North American bird species are in urgent need of conservation action to avoid extinction. <clears throat> and so this is really pointing to a larger problem and a shift of our ecosystems if, with, in their ability to support even the most basic bird life. Um, and the main reason is habitat loss. So why are birds declining? Habitat loss is the number one uh, that we can point to, of course, for um, you know deforestation, development. We all know habitat loss is occurring at unprecedented rates as the human population increases. Outdoor cats, uh, in the US alone, they're estimated to kill 2.4 billion birds, and that includes feral and domestic cats. Even well-fed domestic cats will go out and hunt birds for the fun of it. Phenological mismatch, so this refers to climate change. You know, a bird that migrates down to South America, like a uh, purple martin or like a flycatcher here, they don't know necessarily what the weather is going to be in uh, North America when they normally return. They just normally return when they normally return. And then if we've got a cold um, spring and there's no insects available, uh, that can really affect their breeding success. So phenological mismatch or climate change, light pollution. Many of our migratory birds are traveling by night to get to their destination. And so uh, light shows or uh, just lights from cities can be very disorienting. Um, and if the weather is right and kind of makes them fly lower uh, into the light pollution, uh, it results in a lot of window collisions um, in the night and by morning. Pesticides and other chemicals, synthetic chemicals that we use in our environment and in our food system. Uh, and then window collisions, even window collisions, residential window collisions. So sure, everyone on this Zoom call has heard the thud, the depressing thud of a bird uh, hitting their window at home. So that alone kills uh, you know, millions of birds. So birds are declining uh, and humans are hardwired for a connection to nature. We love birds, they bring us joy. Um, they're beautiful, they're ubiquitous. They're the sounds of, they're in our memories. So many people remember the sound of a wood thrush, you know, playing outside as a child. 
So we need birds, not only for the joy that they bring to our lives, but for the life that they bring to the world. They have a variety of uh, roles in our ecosystem. Uh, I don't need to tell this audience that birds are important and need to be protected, but uh, so they they pollinate plants, they disperse seeds, blue jay disperse, can carry five acorns in its mouth at one time and regenerate forests. Um, many of the birds eat in insects, and so they help um, create that balance. We would have a huge amount of defoliation in our forests if birds didn't exist uh, to eat pests. Um, and they, uh, of course, like the great horned owl you see there, uh, they take care of rodents. Um, if we didn't have vultures, there would be carcasses everywhere. Uh, so they play critical roles in our ecosystems. And if you think of a pileated woodpecker making a big old cavity in a, in a dead tree and then raccoons nesting in it, these are, many of them play keystone roles in our environment, in our habitats. So very important birds are, and they're also indicator species or the canary in a coal mine. So if birds, you have a, a diverse um, multitude of species in a, habitat, in a habitat one year and that's declining or the next year they're not there, that could of course indicate um, a larger problem. Get in here. Come on, Dilly. That's a good girl. So what are the birds trying to tell us? Uh, and I'm just going to take a minute just to make sure all the participants in the Zoom call oh, have sure. your uh, audio while. muted. Uh, just make sure the audio is muted. Yeah, she, I don't think she'd do well with a fake thing. <laughs> but... Somebody is not muted. Okay? Yeah, just make sure your audio is muted. <laughs> Thank you. But you can mute. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Okay, um, and so there are other worrying things happening in parallel to this um, decline of, of birds. Uh, so one of the things we're seeing is uh, this massive insect decline. So this is a, um, a graph from two, uh, 2019. So the total global insect population decline over the past decade is 41%. So that sort of matches this decline of uh, 29 percent of birds in the past 50 years. So what is happening here? Uh, one thing is that not only are we losing habitat um, to things such as we saw in the picture of deforestation, development, but we're also losing quality of habitat. So areas that could provide habitat for birds are just not because the right plants aren't there. For example, our backyards. Much of suburbia today contains a lot of our yards contain ornamental species that we just put there because they're pretty. Uh, they're in nurseries because they're aesthetically pleasing, um, but they're not native to the U.S., which means they don't really support our insects. And the link between the bird and insect decline is that most of our birds, especially when they're nesting, over 94% of our land nesting birds must feed their young insects, especially caterpillars. Uh, those are the most nutritious and important and easy food source uh, for growing baby birds. So in a suburban neighborhood with largely non-native trees, the mama and papa bird is going to have a lot of trouble finding enough caterpillars to feed their young. For example, one um, one couple of chickadees, a, a parent, the parents of a chickadee brood must find, uh, I think, 500 to 600 is what Doug Tallamy discovered, 500 to 600 caterpillars each day uh, to feed their young. So that's a lot of caterpillars. So a native oak tree uh, will support over 500 different species of caterpillars. So plenty of good eaten there, but a non-native ginkgo tree really supports nothing. So 
birds in a suburban neighborhood with not many native plants are going to have trouble. So a lot of what we do um, with our habitat conservation and our education is trying to shift perspectives. So this is a bird's eye view of suburbia uh, and a close up of somebody's backyard. And it's really just biologically uh, barren. It's uh, not a whole lot there. It doesn't support food webs. It may be pretty and green, um, but it's not supporting our food webs, which is what we really need. This is always a funny little, are you still dressed like this? Then why does your yard still look like this? <laughs> so these 18th century style yards are not really sustainable anymore. Sure, you can have a little bit of mowed lawn, um, but if we were to each convert half of our lawn to um, an unmowed area or a purposeful native wildflower meadow or shrub habitat or any kind of habitat with these native plants and structural diversity, we could create a national park of 20 million acres. So there's over 48 million acres of lawn that looks like the previous slide in the US today. And we wanna shift perspectives uh, to help people start seeing the beauty in something like this. It looks a little weedy, this is milkweed, um, but it's supporting the life uh, and the function of the ecosystems. So this is another um, example of a, a native wildflower. I have any very flower. So these native plants Just are not only beautiful, but they restore food webs. And so they can create habitat that, uh, where, you know, we once thought it was lost. So really, uh, Wait, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I just okay. wanted to make a uh, ask if Deb Donaldson can mute herself. We can hear you talking in the background. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah. I think there might be a way for us to mute too. But, uh, um, um, so native plants restore food webs. So one of the things we do at Rushton uh, to promote bird conservation is, of course, getting people to start thinking about their properties as places where conservation can occur. Um, can we think of it from an ecological perspective rather than just aesthetics and mowed lawn? So shrub habitat is so important. It's one of the uh, most declining, steeply declining habitats in Pennsylvania in particular. And one of the problems we see a lot uh, with landowners in our area anyway, are they want either one or the other, like they'll do a, a meadow and they like forest, but this sort of in-between shrub habitat is not very pleasing to people. And, and it's the first habitat that people clear. And the science shows it's one of the most important habitats for birds or all life stages of birds. So a lot of young birds need this. They go straight, even the young bird born in an interior mature woodland heads in the fall um, to areas like this to prepare for its first migration because there's tons of cover from predator. There's a bunch of insects and berries to eat and munch on uh, in safety. And then shrub habitat, native shrub habitat also provides um, really healthy berries uh, and insects that uh, migratory birds need as they're moving through areas. So really important habitat. We have a, at Rushton Woods Preserve, we have a early successional shrub demo area uh, where we have, a, a, it's a, not a very large area, less than an acre, but you can see where we have uh, added native shrubs to the preserve. So this habitat diversity is really key. So another thing we do uh, besides promote habitat is our scientific research at the bird banding station, which happens at our Rushton Woods Preserve. Um, and we do invite the public to that on uh, Thursday, Thursday mornings. And that's a really important aspect of the program because it allows the community to see these wild birds up close that they wouldn't otherwise get a chance to see. And then uh, you have a platform uh, and you, you have their, their full attention to talk to them about these habitat principles and uh, the importance of land conservation and what they can do uh, in their own yards and in their own lives to help birds. So as we learn about birds, we learn about ourselves and the planet. 
So learning about birds through uh, bird banding looks like this. We open the, our, what's called mist nets. We open them at sunrise, like uh, 6 a.m., because most of these birds have been traveling uh, overnight to reach their destination while they're migrating, either fall or spring migration. <clears throat> so we set up these nets in foraging corridors where we know the birds are going to be hunting and they can't really see the net and they fly in and land in a, are sort of cradled in a pocket. We are all federally licensed uh, and trained uh, in how to handle the birds and get them out of the, the pickle that they're in. Looks like this when they're in the nets. And then we bring them back to uh, the banding station study area where they each get a little bracelet uh, that these bands are issued to us from the government, from the USGS. Uh, they each have a nine digit number on them. And so that's sort of the bird's social security number going, for, going forward. And all the data is stored in a centralized database and accessed by researchers. Uh, so while we have the bird in the hand, we try to process them as uh, efficiently as possible. So we'll look at the wings to uh, identify the sex after banding the bird. We'll uh, look at the individual feathers to determine how old the bird is. Um, take some other vital uh, statistics like uh, wing cord. Uh, we even look at their fat. Uh, this is a picture of, so when we blow the feathers, we can see the bird's uh, fat underneath their sort of transparent skin. So the one, the bird on the left, and we're looking at a bird's wishbone area. If you think of a chicken, it's right underneath their, their throat. So the bird on the left has no fat and the bird on the right has a fat of uh, about five and that's the highest that our score goes to. So birds only gain fat uh, for migration. That's like fuel in their tank. And so that's how we can start, we can understand while the bird in it is in the hand, um, understand uh, how healthy the bird is, uh, if it's ready to migrate, and its rate of weight gain, if we capture the bird twice within the same season, we can actually monitor how it's gaining weight and using the habitat. So bird banding occurs throughout the year. There are hundreds of banding stations throughout North America. It's freely available to researchers. All, all the data lives on the BBL or the Bird Banding Lab. Um, information on species, age, sex, location. So if anybody were to capture the bird again, they would be able to um, you know, see where the bird had traveled from. Unfortunately, with traditional bird banding, uh, the recovery of species, capturing a bird that already has a band on it is pretty low. So, of the 64 million, probably over 64 million data points um, ever since bird banding began in the 1960s, there have only been about 4 million recoveries. So you're really not getting a whole lot of movement data from bird banding, but it's not obsolete because we get a lot of other really good important information from bird banding including population trends. So when you think of all these banding stations and uh, you compile the data for say one species, uh, you can see the trends over time. So survivorship from year to year, productivity that refers to a bird's um, young, how many, how many young are the birds having? Um, are, is your habitat a source or a sink uh, during nesting season? Uh, longevity, so for example, this picture is actually of a viri. This is a uh, sort of almost a ground nesting bird nest in Russian woods. And this is our oldest bird. It's 12 years old. So it's always fun when we've got kids at the banding station to tell them that we banded a bird that's older than you. <laughs> so, um, but this was originally banded uh, one of the first years that we were banding. And then 12 years later, we captured it again, saw the band, and were able to deduce that this bird is 12 years old. And we captured it uh, sort of like every other year in between there. So it indicated that this bird found its way back from the tropics to uh, Rushton Woods each year to breed. So that's high site fidelity, loyalty to its breeding site. 
Uh, banding also reveals species abundance and diversity. So we've banded over 103 species um, at Rushton Woods Preserve and almost 20,000 individual birds. We learn about habitat use through banding. So some birds hang out in the woods during the summer and then they move out to the shrub areas to prepare for migration. Uh, we learn about the value of land conservation and stopover ecology. So for example, this is an oven bird that we captured uh, September 1st last year and, the, and weighed him. And then a couple weeks later, he was captured again and weighed and he was determined to have gained 25% uh, of his body mass. So now you can see how this bird is using this habitat as a stopover site on his journey and how his rate gain, uh, how his um, rate of weight gain is going. So that's pretty good or 25% increase in body mass in two weeks uh, may indicate that the habitat quality is uh, pretty good for oven birds at Rushton Woods Preserve. So uh, ornithologists, really they used to only study what birds were doing during the breeding um, breeding season, the breeding part of their annual cycle. But now we know that every single stage is important and there are so many, a, a bird's life is very complex and it uses a different habitat for each of these stages. So it'll have a different breeding habitat. It will have some birds then migrate to an area just to molt and then they start their autumn migration and then winter in a different habitat, and then uh, spring migration. So the full annual cycle is really what we're trying to learn. We need to be really spying on birds their whole life, <laughs> their entire year to really be able to conserve them in the face of everything I told you that is happening to birds today. We need to be able to sort of expedite um, our studies of birds and uh, traditional bird banding really only gives you just a, that glimpse. So in comes MODIS, MODIS Wildlife Tracking Technology. So this is an international collaborative network that uses automated radio telemetry to track the movement of birds and animals across the landscape. And it can go on insects as small as a monarch butterfly. So, and it has really high temporal and spatial um, acuity. It's very, it's becoming one of the most important ways to study the movement uh, and to learn quickly uh, about these animals that we are trying to conserve. So they're battery powered, um, some are solar powered, um, all kinds of innovations occurring. So you, the radio tag is put on the animal and then it has a unique code for that animal or that bird. And then all it has to do is fly within 30 miles of one of these receiving towers and it all gets logged into this centralized database. And then you are able to sort of connect the dots of the movement of this bird without having to capture it again in traditional bird banding. So you can see on the right, that's what it looks like, little white battery pack with an antenna sticking out the back. Um, these are, are very lightweight, less than a 10th of a gram. Um, and it doesn't weigh any more than 3% uh, of the bird's weight. And it goes on as a leg loop harness. And I imagine it sort of looks, a bird feels like this after it's nano tagged. That's my best way of uh, describing how it goes on. People wonder, do you glue it to the feathers? No, it's a leg loop harness. So it goes over the legs. It's sort of like backpack meets fanny pack. So think of it that way. Uh, but MODIS is really allowing, giving us an edge. It's allowing us to uncover migratory pathways much quicker. Um, we're learning about limiting factors. So, um, you know, a certain species of bird, what part of that annual cycle is causing the bird's decline? Is it breeding? Is it wintering? Is it where it's going to molt? Uh, so really getting every piece of the puzzle to help guide conservation decisions. Um, to give you an example <clears throat> of just how fast MODIS is able to get us information, there were uh, 3,000 total gray cheek thrushes and Swainson's thrushes banded 
since uh, uh, banning started in the 1960s, and only six of those have been recovered um, from Colombia, from its overwintering grounds in Colombia. And then in 2016, uh, 36 grade sheet thrushes were nano tagged in Colombia, and 14 were recovered that year uh, as they traveled across North America to their breeding grounds. So huge for bird research. Another uh, fascinating example of what we can learn from MODIS is this is a gray cheek thrush. It's one of our northernmost breeders. Uh, they breed really where the tundra uh, boreal forest meets the tundra. So very shy, secretive northern thrush that overwinters in uh, Colombia, in South America, and uh, uses Colombia as a staging site. Uh, for coming back north to the breeding grounds. Well, they nanotagged a few of these gray-cheeked thrushes in northern Colombia before they set off north for their breeding grounds. And one of them set a record pace uh, for the gray-cheeked thrush species. So it was nanotagged, and then 46 hours later, it was in southern Ontario, uh, and that's about 2,700 miles. So it had flown 2,700 miles in 46 hours. And that's a rate of speed of 47 miles per hour. So that is pretty impressive and only uh, uncovered through a nanotag through MODIS. So pretty cool. And this is just a picture of uh, so we really had to work on the infrastructure for this, so the Northeast MODIS collaboration. Um, we are a partner in that. And so all of these are towers over the years. 2019, you can see we're really putting more towers because that's the only sticking point to this uh, technology is you've got to have the towers, the infrastructure there to be able to learn about these birds. And then anybody who tags, the animals can use uh, the whole system, the whole network of towers. So it really is a collaborative effort. Uh, and in the coming year, we're, we hope to start banding, uh, start nanotagging northern sawwood owls. So we will be uh, part of a, a big uh, regional project of nanotagging these guys to understand their movements a little better. And uh, we're also going to be part of a national wood thrush study. So wood thrush are a species of uh, conservation concern. Uh, they're facing declines nationwide and uh, everyone, the ornithologists are trying to figure out why. So uh, nanotagging nano wood thrush from every corner of the US is really gonna help us understand that big picture. <clears throat> So working collaboratively to understand and protect birds throughout the annual cycle is crucial for reversing bird declines. I'm gonna go back to that at the end if I have time. I wanna make sure I have time for questions and discussions. Um, so let's get into coffee because this is another way that we can protect birds throughout their full uh, annual cycle. So I'll we'll start with a little history of coffee. So coffee, uh, for those who don't know, are uh, you don't really think of coffee as being a seed, but the coffee bean that you see is actually the pit of, a, of the fruit that looks like this. It's the seed of a berry. And so it was discovered um, pre 17th century, uh, discovered in Ethiopia, there was a astute uh, goat shepherd who was tending his herds in the Ethiopian highlands, and his goats ate these magic berries, as he called them, magic green and red berries, and they got really excited and be started behaving erratically. And so he thought, huh. And so he told uh, some religious workers at a local monastery, and they thought, huh. Well, what if we drink this fruit? The um, what if we sort of brew this and drink it? So they did that, and they discovered that they could stay up all night praying. And they thought, "Wow, the world needs to know about this." <laughs> so, so it spread from its origination in Eastern Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, 
was cultivated and traded um, around that continent before gaining popularity in Europe. So the 17th century coffee houses started coming about. So this is a time when water was often not safe to drink. So you either had the choice of alcohol or now you had coffee. <laughs> so coffee was a stimulating, um, a, sort of a sober alternative to drinking alcohol. So you'd come to these coffee houses for some la news and a lively debate. Uh, some of the naysayers called the invention of coffee, called it the bitter invention of Satan. Uh, but historians credit these coffee houses, these 17th century coffee houses, with uh, actually seeding the scientific revolution. And so now coffee is one of the most valuable tropical export crops grown across 27 million acres across the globe. Um, the areas in dark is what we call the coffee belt. The number one producer now is Brazil. And one of the top consumers is us, the US. We drink a third of the world's coffee. 63% of American adults drink coffee daily. So this is coffee Arabica. Uh, that's the 70% of the world's coffee is this strain of coffee. And uh, it is the one that naturalized in uh, South America. Uh, back in the day when it was getting smuggled and traded all around the world. Uh, so its preferred temperature is 64 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's kind of cool if you think about a, a tropical environment. So coffee Arabica really prefers upland, oops, upland habitat, upland or higher elevations in these tropical zones. And it wants to grow in the shade in the understory of a tropical rainforest. So it creates that understory and that structural diversity that I mentioned before is so important for an ecosystem, uh, really thrives and helps create that um, more habitat for all kinds of wildlife and birds. Um, so when you grow it in the shade, as an agricultural crop, you are preserving that natural system and that structural diversity. And you don't need a whole lot of inputs because it naturally grows that way. So uh, you can see the coffee shrubs here growing underneath uh, an overstory. So you don't have to use herbicides because you have the leaf litter from the canopy falling on the soil, sort of suppressing weeds. Uh, and then all these leaves also add to the nutrients in the soil. And so you don't need to any addition of um, synthetic fertilizers because you, always, you already have all of these surrounding plants. And then you don't have to use pesticides either because the coffee plant is growing in a natural ecosystem, sort of like what I described uh, Rushton supports. So you've got uh, bats, birds, all kinds of wildlife that will help um, create that balance of insects and uh, keep the pest populations down. So it's really a, a natural, very functioning ecosystem. So, however, uh, in the 1970s, coffee started be being grown differently. Um, 1972, a sun-tolerant coffee was created, a sun-tolerant variety. And then coffee farmers said, hey, if I grow it in the sun, I can have two harvests instead of one. And so many of the shade farms in Latin America started uh, transitioning to uh, sun coffee, and which requires clear cutting of the tropical rainforest. And so today, three quarters of the world's coffee is grown in the sun where entire ecosystems have been destroyed. So sun coffee, because it's out in the sun away from any natural inputs, then you need all these synth synthetic uh, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides. Uh, so it really degrades the soil after a while. So a handful of soil is supposed to contain more organisms that have ever lived on planet Earth. And when you put all of these synthetic chemicals, you're essentially killing the soil and you're causing unsustainable erosion. 
So there was a study in Nicaragua of two coffee farms on the same hillside. One was in the sun and one was shaded. And the one that was in the sun lost two and a half times more soil than the shade coffee farm. So this is unsustainable because when you lose topsoil and you lose the quality of the soil, uh, what happens is the farmers need to go and then clear more tropical rainforest habitat. And so the gains are really nearsighted of this sun coffee. So when forests disappear, migratory songbirds disappear too. So it's easy to think of the parrots and the toucans that are losing their habitat, but it's our birds too, because they are birds of two worlds. So birds like this Baltimore Oriole that's in your backyard in the summer, or maybe at your uh, orange feeder, they are down there in South America during the winter looking for habitat created by these shade coffee farms. <clears throat> Two in five Baltimore Orioles are gone since 1970, so they've taken a hit as well. Could it be because of the loss of wintering habitat due to deforestation from coffee? Possibly. So the connection is very, uh, very real. So you have all of these birds traversing the globe. Uh, they connect us across hemispheres. They're, this is a picture of the eight major flyways. We are over in the Atlantic flyway and our birds are flying uh, right down to Brazil and South America. So here's the coffee and there's the birds. So uh, the overlap is inevitable. <clears throat> so many different birds, these are all pictures of mine from our bird banding station that were just um, captured and banded uh, last year. And every single one of these species uh, possibly overwinters in uh, Latin American habitat that is provided by these tropical forests. So the black and white warbler, the Canada warbler, the indigo bunting, the Baltimore oriole, the common yellow throat, the magnolia warbler, the black throated green warbler, the Cape May warbler, or the black throated blue warbler. All of this glittering diversity of birds depends on the forests in the tropics. And isn't green good enough, someone might say, but it's definitely not because we know that a uh, sun coffee farm doesn't offer, again, the, the theme of this talk is that structural diversity. That is what uh, birds need. So this is just a little uh, depiction of a rainforest and all the complexities, the birds that are found in the upper level, the lower level, the middle level. So you have this whole mosaic that is supported by when you choose bird-friendly coffee. So uh, in the 1990s, uh, the Migratory Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center said, hey, we're going to start uh, incentivizing people, these farmers, to switch back to shade-grown coffee. So let's make this certification. So the they have the bird-friendly Smithsonian label. And Farms that are certified as bird friendly uh, comply to a very stringent list of criteria. Uh, and this is really the gold emblem uh, for sustainability. So if it's bird friendly, it means that it's supporting over three times as many bird species as a sun grown coffee farm. And then you can see from this graph, there's areas in between, like partial shade will support 79 bird species, which is better than sun grown. But bird friendly is really the best because they go down there, uh, a third party uh, investigator and make sure uh, they've got a list of criteria from canopy, foliage, canopy height and cover to foliage density to insect biodiversity. So what they really are looking for is that these farms are mimicking natural undisturbed tropical rainforest, which is what our birds need. And then of course, that is pesticide free. The, they may not have the organic certification all the time, but by nature, a bird friendly coffee is going to be organic. So these are some of the certifications you'll see. Bird friendly is always gonna be the best. You'll see the Rainforest Alliance on coffee bags, and this isn't really the best certification because 
they only require about 30% of the, uh, the coffee farm to be in shade. And then they also allow the farmers to keep using pesticides. So it's really not as good as bird friendly certification. <clears throat> so in addition, bird friendly coffee is generally going to have a superior flavor and of all the different roasters that we've met with, uh, they have confirmed that this is true uh, because when it's grown in the shade, the coffee berries, they develop, they ripen slower than they do in the sun. And the slower they ripen, the more natural sugars they can um, develop, which adds to enhanced flavor. Uh, they have more sort of complexities and nuances to the flavor because it's ripening slower. And then also these coffees, if it's grown in the shade and bird friendly, generally it's going to be at a higher altitude, which creates lower acidity, lower caffeine content, which gives the coffee a smoother taste and it's really better for you. And they're going to be higher quality beans because when you think about it now, this, this coffee plant that's growing in an understory of a tropical rainforest, it's grabbing nutrients from other all the other different kinds of plants around it. So it's a higher quality bean. And then coffee and climate change. This is a picture of a coffee, a raw coffee bean. And that ugly little thing is a coffee berry borer beetle. <clears throat> so one of the things that scientists are anticipating is that with climate change, warming climate, there's going to be a reduced growing area of that coffee built and the pests are actually doing better in warmer temperatures. So uh, the coffee crop's going to have some problems. And then the quality of course decreases because the hotter the temperature, the faster that ripening process. So some people are recommending to farmers that they should start adapting to shade grown uh, just for resilience in the face of climate change, even if, you know, they don't care about birds, it's, it may help um, in the future of our changing climate. So the sun coffee is just is very vulnerable to any fluctuations in the coffee market. It's vulnerable to weather, erosion. Where, and pests, whereas the shade grown coffee, you've got all the diversity of wildlife to help with the pest. You've got, it's in the shade, which helps with the temperature. Uh, and then the farmer also has all these different other crops that they can rely on. So medicine, lumber, fruit. Uh, so they have resilience if, if something happens to the coffee crop. So it's really a win-win situation. It's just a little video for you guys. For someone who drinks coffee, sits in his or her kitchen, say, and looks out the window and sees this migratory bird out there and thinks, well, maybe that bird was on a coffee farm that produced the coffee I'm drinking right here. For a lot of people, that's a really strong emotional connection. Coffee is grown in these, what are called biodiversity hotspots. Coffee evolutionarily is an understory crop, and so it's evolved to do well in the shade. When you take the shade away from a coffee farm, you're changing it from something that looks very much like a forest to something that looks like, my best description is English hedgerows. But in terms of habitat for forest songbirds, it really doesn't offer very much. So what you do is you change the landscape and birds that would normally be using that habitat, they no longer have that habitat. If we're looking at a shade coffee plantation, in simplest terms, it's gonna look very much like a forest. You're gonna have a level of shade trees that the farmer manages. It's going to form a canopy of 10, 12, 14 meters tall. Under that, um, the farmer may well have things like fruit trees, like uh, oranges, or avocados, persimmons, of course bananas, um, and then over that the farmer may allow to grow what we call emergent species that come out way taller 
And what they then form is this structural diversity. And it's this structural diversity that is very highly correlated with bird species diversity. So what we have is these migratory birds going back and forth every year, farmers in Latin America producing coffee, and consumers in North America drinking it. So you get two cultures sort of joined by these organisms that you know, have evolved the system of going back and forth every, every year. Bird-friendly coffee means that it is a coffee grown on land that creates habitat for birds, viable quality habitat. One, it's organic. Two, it looks like a forest and it meets certain criteria that we've developed. It, it came right out of research based on science and we have taken it to the marketplace. All right. Whoops. So <clears throat> that is why we decided to start the Bird Friendly Coffee Coalition with the Trust. So you can go to our website. It's listed there. Um, actually, I can put that in the chat too at the end um, so you can check it out. Uh, but what our goal is to is to uh, conserve and regenerate tropical bird habitat by increasing consumer demand for bird friendly coffee. And we're trying to do that through educating and encouraging merchants, uh, roasters and the public. So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So we got a we have a very courageous volunteer who has spearheaded. Uh, she first went to Griffin Coffee Company, and just said, "Hey, do you know about bird friendly coffee?" And they were totally on board. They came out to uh, Rushton Woods Preserve. They saw banding. They you know got on board. They're really gung ho. Uh, they were our first partner. Uh, they helped, they created a coffee with us, uh, Blackburnian Brew. So our, that's uh, now available for sale in their stores and it is bird friendly. And they also have a decaf coffee as well. Uh, we just spoke at a uh, Kimberton managers meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and they're really excited and they're selling Griffin coffee. So you can go to any Kimberton Whole Foods and pick up a bag of Blackburnian brew. And then hopefully they're even going to have it in their uh, cafes. So this is what you can look for when you go to Kimberton Whole Foods or in Griffin, any of their, so Griffin has a location in Westchester and then also Wayne. And so here's our, it says Blackburnian Brew, bird friendly in collaboration with Willistown Conservation Trust. And so we're really uh, behind this project. We're really just trying to educate and people about bird conservation and save the birds. We don't stand to make a whole lot of money from doing this. Uh, if you buy it in the cafe, it's about mm, $16, $17 and a dollar goes to the trust. But if you buy it from Kimberton, they've lowered the price. I think it's only like $11. Um, but we all need to help keep it, keep the demand up. So I urge you to go to your Kimberton Whole Foods and grab uh, a bag of Blackburnian brew, or if you want the decaf, that's Inbu decaf. So Inbu is the uh, banding code for indigo bunting. And so all these birds are birds that overwinter on uh, bird-friendly coffee farms. So they were just, Griffin Coffee Company was just awesome to work with. They are just so excited. And they actually told us that the sales that they're now getting uh, through the demand for bird-friendly at all the Kimberton Whole Foods, 
uh, is equivalent to if Griffin Coffee Company had opened a whole nother cafe so that their roaster almost can't keep up. So it's really, really exciting. And it just shows that we can make change and that people do want to do the right thing. It's just a matter of education. It's it's so key. Um, you know, most people just haven't heard of bird friendly. And once they do, they they want to do it. Uh, so we need to just keep demanding it. Uh, I encourage all of you to, you know, go to your local coffee shop, your favorite, well, maybe not Starbucks, that might be a tough shell to crack, but uh, <laughs> go to some other local coffee shop and introduce them to um, bird friendly and, and see what they say and see if they, they want to get on board. We have um, some materials that uh, are, will be on our website that you can share. Um, if you want to sort of help us spread the gospel. So, you know, again, if more and more of us demand it, uh, it trickles down and the farmers will want to do the right thing uh, if the if the consumers are demanding it. So every small cup of sun-grown coffee costs one square inch of rainforest, whereas each cup of bird-friendly coffee conserves rainforest. So one square inch may not seem like a lot, but when you consider 63% of Americans are drinking coffee on the daily, that's a lot. So when you purchase bird friendly, you're preserving critical habitat for wildlife, you're fighting climate change, you're protecting biodiversity, and you're supporting farmers committed to farming sustainably. And I'll just leave you with this quote by biologist Thomas Lovejoy. If you take care of birds, you take care of most of the big problems in the world. <laughs> Every cup counts. All right. With that, I will stop my share so I can see your lovely faces. And if anybody has any questions or you want to open it up for a little discussion here. I'd love to hear from you all. So we did um, we did have some questions in the chat, and I will I'm happy to read them out if you want to uh, consider them. Uh, someone asked. Uh, they're interested in. They were curious if they if you have any information on bird friendly instant coffee. Starbucks has a expensive instant coffee and they partner with Conservation International. Uh, I'm not sure if you know anything about yeah. instant. Yeah, I know that instant coffee, coffee you're talking about. The Starbucks Via, I am a consumer of that. <laughs> I'm trying not to though anymore because it's not bird friendly, but I used to, used to use that. But uh, yeah, Starbucks isn't, they do a lot of greenwashing as far as I know. Um, they have some claims that their coffee is bird friendly and it's it's not. Uh, they have fair trade certifications. They have one organic coffee on their shelves. I think it's called Yukon. Um, but it's not via. It's called uh, premium instant. It comes in a little metal tin. Huh. You say it's new. Oh, prominently on the label that they're, you know, partnering with Conservation International and they have a website and I looked it up and it looked like some sustainability things were going on. Um, but instant is really good for recipes and things like that. And yeah. Fun. Um, so yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah, that would be, maybe I should, maybe we should talk to Griffin if they would, I don't know if, see that when you go to a, like a, a really good roaster who wants to do the right, like they don't even, Griffin doesn't even sell ground coffee. Like they'll grind it for you, but they won't even sell ground coffee because, you know, to a professional coffee person, when you grind it like a day later, it's not as fresh. Now to us normal people, we may not be able to notice that, but <laughs> they do and they won't even sell ground for that reason. So I would imagine that uh, instant would be like horrifying to them. <laughs> but I, can, I can mention it to them though. It's an interesting, um, interesting idea. I'll write that down. I'll ask them for you. So I'd like to mention that uh, having been out to watch you bird ban, uh, Blake, uh, and seeing the bag of coffee, I went right off to Griffin Cafe to buy bags of that coffee uh, for uh, 
one reason was to be able to use a bag at a table event when I'm doing bird town and talking about native plants and having a bag of coffee there. And uh, uh, unbeknownst to me, because I bought a bag, I get a free cup of coffee when I go into to Griffon Cafe. Oh, uh, so that's a benefit that uh, not aware of. Oh, they do they do free cups of coffee for for every few bags or? Well, I I bought one bag at one point and got a, a free cup, and at the other point, I bought three bags and got a free cup. They didn't give me three free cups, but oh, very nice. <laughs> yes. I have a, a question that I, I couldn't write in the in the chat. When you say uh, bird friendly, is is that the same thing as carrying the Smithsonian seal, or does it refer to uh, other coffee growers that don't have the Smithsonian seal? Um. Well, I mean, we talked to. Uh, one roaster who said that it was very enlightening. She said that most artisan coffees that have that good flavor, like when you get coffee from Starbucks, it kind of has that burnt flavor. They call that conventional coffee. And an artisan coffee maker knows right away if it's conventional or if it's artisan. And if it's artisan, then she says it's bird friendly. They're generally the farmers are doing the right thing to get that higher quality product. And it's just not certified bird friendly. Now. Yeah. Well that. So. I mean, I, I really appreciate that you said the Smithsonian is the gold seal. It's, yeah. it's the gold standard for bird friendly coffees. And there are a lot of ways of growing coffee where they can claim it's bird friendly, mm -hmm. but it's it's not as rigorously uh, yeah. uh, investigated as the Smithsonian, where essentially what they're doing is uh, ensuring that these are uh, coffee that's grown in native habitat rather than just growing in the shade, because you can plant you know any kind of a tree that provides exactly. shade and call it shade grown. Mm -hmm. So the yep. the Smithsonian is what we all ought to be looking for to mm -hmm. uh, uh, to make sure that it's really uh, good habitat for the birds. Yeah, yeah, shade grown is better than nothing, but it's not as good as Smithsonian certified bird friendly because shade yeah. grown a coffee farmer can just have the coffee plants growing under an understory of a monoculture of eucalyptus trees, and yeah. that's not. You know, obviously that's not mimicking a natural, diverse, tropical ecosystem, but it's grown in the shade. So that's where you kind of have to be the the conscientious consumer. Thank you. I just put in the chat the link to uh, our Bird Friendly Coffee Coalition website. Uh, there might be some information there, might be useful. There's links. Uh, to dive into Smithsonian certification and uh, their website more. And uh, eventually, Griffin is working on their website, but eventually you'll be able to go right onto the Griffin website from ours or directly from Griffin and order uh, bird friendly. But right now, it's still, you have to buy it on location, the Blackburnian brew. There's like, good are there any other roasters? Web on the, right. I'm sorry on the QR code on the back of your package too, on the back of the package. Oh so yeah. Yep. Coffee. If you buy the coffee, there's a QR code on the back that takes you to um, our website, talks about the Willistown Conservation Trust. Right. And if you have, if anybody has contacts with a roaster, if you, you know, have somebody, you know, or, um, you know, you could make an ask, we do have, you could let us know. Or we do have um, uh, pamphlets like this to give to uh, roasters to um, uh, sort of petition <laughs> and get them on board. So we want to look as official as possible. So we've got all kinds of handouts to give uh, to prospective uh, roasters and merchants I'm trying to get more partners on board. But we're really happy with 
our current partners, Kimberton and Griffin, they've, they've been awesome to work with. So. Um, were there any other questions that were you, did you have a question, Gretchen or? Oh, I, um, I think someone else was just curious, uh, were, are we working with any other, uh, or exploring any other relationships with other local, uh, coffee shops? Yeah, we have a list right now. We're trying to figure out how to make it sustainable <laughs> mm -hmm. because, um, we have our our staff here is kind of maxed out and our volunteer who's been putting a lot of energy into this isn't getting paid uh so she's we're meeting with smithsonian next week to see what support we can get from them um but at this point we really need another roaster because griffin is maxed out with with what we've provided them the their new clientele from kimberton whole foods so for us to go to more merchants uh, you know, more grocery shops, we would need another roaster. So we need another roaster first, really, to make, to get more of that bird friendly in our area. Like, I just want to say before anyone else leaves, just thank you so much for an outstanding presentation. I learned so much. I wrote pages and pages of notes. It was just wonderful information. So thank you again for putting this together for Bird Town Leaders. You're welcome. Yeah, and it's all been recorded, hopefully, if I did that correctly. <laughs> so uh, we'll send the link after this, um, well, maybe tomorrow, uh, and so that anybody who wasn't able to attend can see it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great to see everybody here tonight. Thanks, Blake. Any other, any other <laughs> questions or comments? You're all invited to come out. Spring is just around the corner. Um, so we'll be out at the bird banding station, April and May, uh, I encourage you to go to our website and sign up for one of the public Thursdays so you can see it mm -hmm. in person. And then, uh, we have a bird walk, uh, coming up, not this weekend, but the following where actually Griffin coffee company will be doing a tasting, mm -hmm. um, actually a pour over demonstration, and then we'll, uh, go birding on the preserve. So if you're, if you're up for a little winter birding, come on out February 17th. Uh, again, you can um, check out our website and the events are on there to register. Hope to see you guys out there. Wonderful. Thanks again. Thanks. Good Thank work. you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Blake, thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Gretchen. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Good night. Okay. Good night. Why does it matter? Get all the questions. I didn't wasn't able to look at all of them. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna sign off, Blake. Great job. All right, thanks, Gretchen. Have a good all night. Right. Take care. Thanks again.